Hey friend, welcome back. Uh, again, we are building out chess. In this uh, episode, what we're gonna work on is adding logic for taking turns. So we're gonna build out a game class and we'll talk about uh, swapping between two different players. We might build a player class and we're gonna take turns entering in uh, moves and then re-rendering the board and doing some fun stuff there. So let's add, let's add a new file called game.rb and in our game class, uh, we're gonna have a new method play and let's see, what do we want play to actually do? So this is going to be some sort of like, this is where our game loop is. So we want to like um, prompt, like prompt a, like the current player to enter um, a uh, starting position. Um, then we want to prompt the player to enter an ending position. Then we want to like uh, move the piece. Uh, okay. So we need some concept of a current player. So when the game is first initialized, I think we want to pass in or sort of like initialize. We probably want to set up uh, in the in the initializ initialization of a game here. Um, I think we want to like we need reference to a board. We need reference to a board renderer. We need reference to players. We need, we need a couple of different things. Now, again, um, we have a couple of options here. So one thing we could do is just say like at player one is player dot new at player two is player dot new. And maybe these take in the color white and black. Um, and then we could sort of just toggle between those two. So maybe the current current player is player one. Um, and then we can say like, maybe we have a method here, swap player. And the swap player is just gonna like switch who player one is. So then we can say like at, um, or yeah, uh, let's see. So let's do adder reader for player one and player two. And then we can do an adder assessor for current player. And here we can say self.current player is equal to um, the person who is not the current player. So then we want to say, we kind of want to say like, if at current or like if current player is equal to player one, then we want to return player two. Otherwise we want to return player one. And that should like swap who, who the current player is. Um, and then, yeah, we need the con some sort of concept of a player. So we need to like create a new class called player. And it is going to be, uh, I guess it's gonna be initialized with the color and um, yeah, so I guess we can just print out the color, like it's so-and-so's turn, like it's player one's turn or something like that. So then in the game, maybe here we can, like to start out, we can say like puts it's, let's say it's, um, current player dot color, uh, it's their turn. And then let's see, let's see what that looks like. Um, so we need to go back into, into main here and we need to import uh, both player and game. And then we need to test this out. So I'm actually just gonna delete all of these and then say like uh, g is equal to game dot new and then g dot play. And then we'll see what happens can run this. It's blank's turn. <laughs> okay, so when we initialize the player, we passed in the color and we have a reader for the color. And let's see. Yeah, player.new, we passed in the colors. It's so-and-so's colors game. Uh, current player, did I spell something wrong here? No. Um, why isn't it printing something out? Huh, interesting. Um, so let's p current player and see if there's actually something there. 
because we should have gotten back the string representation of the symbol, black and white. Okay, so we see the player, and then what if we put current uh, player.color? So it should be player one. We should see black. It is black's turn. So why is it not showing us anything? Maybe we need to do 2s here or something. Um, it is a symbol, but it should still show when we print it out like that. Uh, player, yeah, player.new. So the other thing too that's on my mind is that in the initialize method, anytime that you see, um, okay, so that is definitely not working. So what is going on with that? So the current player is this player and the color is not being set. So in the player, maybe I misspelled color in here. No, did I spell initialize wrong? Maybe. Um, that has bitten me tons of times, misspelling initialize. Uh, I see why in Python they call it init. It's like underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, which it does like the same thing as it uh, here in Ruby. Okay, so now, now we're at a point where we kind of really need to like figure out what's going on and why the color isn't being passed in. Um, and so we could like put color here. Uh, oh, pfft. I'm saying at color, but I'm not actually storing it at color equals color. All right, that, that makes um, way more sense. All right, that was confusing. I don't know why that took so long, but I'm printing out things for the win, right? Okay, so it should say it is Black's turn. Let's see. Okay, fantastic. It is Black's turn. Great. All right. Um, then what we want to do is say like um, puts select a piece and then we want to receive some input and i guess the input we could re we could receive the input as like comma separated values but the input is going to come in as strings no matter what and then we're going to need to like parse it into um we're, we'll need to parse it into uh integer values and i'm thinking that like we don't actually want to know too much about how we get the move while we're inside the game class like i think the player should be responsible for knowing how to receive a move from the player the reason is that like technically a player, we could we could implement a human player class or a computer player class or a dog player class or whatever. And each of those might have different ways of finding which move they want. And really all we care about is the move. So what I wanna say here is, is maybe like start pause is equal to current player dot get pause or something like that. And then um, that would retrieve like get pause in inside of the player class, we can implement get pause as the as a method that uh, asks the player for some input. So let's make a method here, get pause. And we're gonna say gets dot chomp. That should um, get a string from uh, from the standard in and then remove the new lines from it. And so we're gonna say like uh, raw position is equal to that. And then what we want to do is like, um, I think we want to say like X and Y is equal to raw pause dot split on comma. And then we can, um, so after we split them on comma, we need to turn them from strings into integers. So then I think we can say dot map. Um, and this will be applied to each of the elements. Um, and then we can say like the part and we want the part.2i, and let's see what we get back. So then I, I guess we're gonna return x and y as our locations, or row and column, or whatever. It doesn't really matter a ton here. So actually, in fact, I think we could just return this, maybe. And in even going deeper, we could probably just return that. So we're getting a string from the terminal, then we're gonna remove any new lines from the end or any white space from the end. Then we're gonna split on comma. And then we are going to map it to integers and return the value of that entire thing as our get position. So let's run it again. And from the game, do we have it printing this out? So let's, uh, let's print out start pause and let's run this. So we should, it should see like it's black's turn, select a piece then it should wait for input and we're gonna enter in some input. Okay, so select a piece. 
So now we're gonna enter in like one, two, and we hit enter and we get back uh, the array one, two. That's exactly what we want, okay. Um, select a piece, maybe we say select a piece to move, and then we say puts like select a position to move to, and then we're gonna again prompt for the end position this time. So we're gonna say like, okay, we get the, the end pause, and we'll print that out also, P end pause, and let's take a look. Okay, select a piece to move, one, one, and then select a position to move to, four, four, Okay, so now what we need to do is like actually figure out, okay, it's Black's turn. They are, right when they're selecting a piece to move, we should check to see like, is that piece actually their piece? And if it is, then and only then do we select, like ask them to select an end position. Otherwise, we wanna like have them again select a piece to move. So I think we wanna sort of like loop do. Um, we wanna keep doing this until they select a valid piece. So here what we need to do is say like, um, ah, okay, so now we're at the point where we actually need a board. We need a board class. So um, the question becomes like, should we, all right, so back to what I was saying before, like because we are using the name of a class here inside of the initialize method, we know that um, we're creating a really hard and strong dependency between game and player, right? Like the player is not being passed in. And so when you use this game class, you can only use this type of player. There's no way to change from this class of player to a human player or a computer player or whatever, because we are using the, the class name here. So um, you might have like the instinct to say like, oh, let's just do at board is board.startchess. And we're off to the races, right? Our game has reference to a board, it has reference to two players but it's actually like a little bit better practice to do what's called dependency injection. So right now what we're doing is we're, we're like hard coding the dependencies directly into the class, right? So we're, depend we're, 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 we're writing these class names. Because we're writing the class names, it makes it more difficult to change how this works in the future. So instead of, uh, instead of hard coding these class names, let's actually pass in, let's pass in, um, Let's pass in the board and then we could either pass in the class of the player or we could pass in the actual instances of the players. So let's, this one's going to be board instead of, uh, instead of hard coding it here. And then we can, let's also just do player one and player two, and we'll have those passed in from whoever is the user of the game class. That way, if we wanted to make player two a human player and player one computer, or human versus human or whatever, we could do that from um, when we're initializing and newing up an instance of the game. So here we're gonna say this is player one and this is player two. That makes it a little bit more flexible. Hopefully that's um, obvious. So this is like known as dependency injection and it makes it much easier to, uh, to work with your classes. They become much more flexible. And so down here now we need to pass in a board. So B is board.start chess and we can pass in um, the board first and then we need player one and we need player two. Um, I think we can just say like player.new uh, black and player.new white. The other thing we could have done is like set the color inside of the game. Um, but for now this is probably this is probably cool. Uh, all right, so what do we've got what have we got going on now? All right, so we're initializing our game class. We're passing in the board and our players, and then we're hitting play. And then in the board, or I'm sorry, in the game, uh, in the game class, we are playing and we're looping over this and saying select a piece to move. But the whole reason we were talking about all of that was that we actually need to know what the piece is at that starting position. So let's grab the piece from the board. So now that we have the board, we should be able to say, um, uh, let's also make that a reader board. So now that we have the board, we can say um, the board at the starting position is the board at the starting position's color the same as the current player.color. Um, and if it is, then we want to break. Otherwise, we want to um, 
Otherwise, what we want to do is like say reselect a piece. But first, before we do that, we want to print out um, a message, just like a little error message that says that's not your piece. So it puts um, uh, did not select a, and then we can say the current player dot color piece. So it'll say like did not select a black piece or did not select a white piece when that happens. And then we should, yeah, it should sort of like walk us through that. The other thing we want to do probably is like every time before we, we play, we want to like render the board out. Um, so in addition to this board in like this board being injected, we probably also want to inject like the renderer. Um, so maybe we just call this like renderer and we can also store that at renderer is renderer. And again, we'll make it an adder reader. And down here we can say renderer dot render. Actually, yeah. Um, hmm. Because we need reference, this needs reference to the board, I think. Um, yeah, we just made this an adder reader. Let's make it adder assessor so that we can set it on the board class. And then we'll come back over here and we will say renderer is like this, and then we'll set its board. So renderer.board is equal to board. Um, okay. So notice how I'm continuing to just keep all the instance variable definition or declarations and setting in the initialize method. We're not actually using instance variables anywhere else. Um, that's to keep things flexible. Okay, we run this again. Now we should see uh, uh, initialize wrong number of arguments, three, okay, right, because we didn't pass in the renderer. And in fact, we could probably pass, well, yeah. I was thinking about maybe just passing in the class name for the renderer, which is common. So yeah, board renderer text, maybe. And then we can actually like new it up in here. So let's, let's, I wanted, yeah, let's just talk about um, renderer class. So we can pass a class around as an argument. So here we're not actually initializing an instance. We're just passing the class name, right? And because we're passing a class name, we can use that class just like we would any other class inside of here. So we can actually say the renderer class, whoops, renderer class dot new and pass in board. That makes it a little bit cleaner. And now we could just easily swap out what the renderer class is. Um, we could have done the same thing with the players, but uh, whatever, that's fine. The risk we run with accepting the player, the actual instance of the player, is that we don't have control over which color the player is, but I think that's okay. Um, okay, so here we go. It's Black's turn, select a piece to move. So if I pick an invalid position, so if I say like 3-3, three, three, then um, let's see, what did we get? Line 21 in our loop. So we're inside of our loop and line 24 inside of game block and play 24. Um, is it the same color as the current player? What is our error here? Undefined method color for nil class. Okay, so this is where we're trying to check the color of the board position. Now, all right, now it's time to actually dig into the nil object pattern. Um, because actually we'll come back and refactor again. <laughs> All right. So board at, uh, start pause, um, is, uh, not nil and its color is our color. So because we have to do this check here, this is super annoying, right? And this is actually a really common error in Ruby is undefined method blah for nil class. It's because you're trying to call a method. We were trying to call color when we reached into the board and we got back nothing because we were passing three, three, which is like over here, right? There's no piece there. And I was expecting it to say did not select a black piece, but instead it crashed because we have a nil, a nil exception for nil class. And so the way that you get around it is generally by going everywhere and putting like uh, is this thing not nil? And if it's not nil, then do whatever, which is what we just did. But there is a, a, a tool, a handy tool for this that we'll, we'll come back to in another, another episode. Um, I want to just do like kind of like a big refactoring with null, with the null object pattern in one sweep. So, all right, so let's um, pick a piece. Okay, did not select a black piece, fantastic. 
So now if we pick like one, 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 okay, then we are, then we are prompted to select a position to move to. This is where we need to loop again and say like, okay, um, you know, try to move to that end position. And then if it doesn't work, then keep trying. So we need to like, I think we need like potentially another loop, but let's just say two, two, and then it gives us back. It's just printing out two, two. Um, so uh, let's see. So we're prompting for the start position. Then here we're prompting for the end position. Um, and uh, I think we do want to loop here. And what we want to do is actually loop and we want to try to move the piece on the board. So we want to say like board dot move, move piece, I think from start pause to end pause. Um, and it might fail. Um, this thing might raise an exception. So I think we need to, we probably need to wrap this in a, uh, in a begin rescue. Um, but let's, let's just, Let's just try it out because we, we should fail if we're trying to move the piece to an invalid spot. So let's rerun this. Okay, select a piece to move, uh, one, one, and we're gonna move it to two, two, and it failed. Okay, here we go. Undefined local variable or method start position. Oh, great, yes, okay. So I am creating this local variable start position here. Um, and I'm then trying to use it down here. The, th the reason why I'm seeing this exception undefined method or undefined method or local variable start position is because this is block scoped. So this start position variable is only available inside of this block, right? Because I created this local variable inside of this do end block. It's not available inside of the method yet. And because of that, because it's inside of this block, uh, I do not have access to it down here where I'm inside of another block. So I need to I need to lift the scope of this variable up one level by and I can do that by just saying like um, start position is equal to nil. So we'll sort of like initialize this local variable so that then when I set it here, I'm actually just updating this local variable that is local now to the function play and should then also be available down here. So that's a really good um, yeah, good thing to think about in terms of like block scoping in Ruby. So, okay, select a piece to move one, one, and we want to move to two, two and great end position two, two is not in available moves to one, three, one. Okay. So what I think we want to do here is add begin, um, a begin rescue block and uh, generally it's bad practice to just put rescue because that will rescue all possible exceptions that are going to happen inside of here. So instead it's a little bit better to pass the specific type of error that we expect to be raised here. And right now from our board class on line 59, we are just saying runtime error. So uh, what I think we want to do is go to our board class. We're going to go back to our board class. And rather than just raising these exceptions with string values, what we want to do is raise a new error type, which is like invalid move or something like that. So if we go up here and we create a new file and we call it invalid move uh, error or something, invalid move error dot rb, then we can create a new class, invalid move error. And this is going to inherit from. Um, like argument error. There's a whole bunch of different exception types that you could um, that you could return. And for now, we won't pass anything in. But I think argument error should accept the string as as a first argument. We can actually look that up. Ruby argument error. Let's see. Or should we inherit from runtime error? Uh, yeah, argument error dot new, and then you uh, use this is this is basically what we want. So the error is that the the value that was passed in is in is invalid, but this gives us a very specific error type that we can then handle inside of our game class. So we want to we're going to rescue this type of exception is the invalid move error. Um, so when we are in the board and we see that there was an invalid thing, rather than just raising this string value for runtime error. We're going to raise a 
invalid move error dot new and we're going to pass that string value in so that we are actually raising a very specific error type okay um, all right let's see I think that should run and work a little bit better um, if we go back to our game so this we want we're going to continue looping but if we don't if we are if, if we actually are able to move the piece then we don't want to keep looping so then we're going to say just like break here and if it was an invalid move we can say um, like puts uh, unable to move to that location um, actually we can just print out the error message so uh, here we have reference to the exception so we can just say p E dot message, I think, and that should like, or puts E dot message should print out the message for the exception that we just created, the invalid move error exception that we just created. All right, let's see. Okay, pick a piece to move, one, one, and we're gonna move it to two, two, and that should fail. Uninitialized constant invalid move error. <laughs> okay, so we need to import this thing. Try again. Okay, one, one, and we're moving to two, two. Great, end position two, two is not in available moves two, one, or three, one. Select a position to move two. So then we can say like, oh, okay, let's actually just go to two, one. And then we didn't see, okay, so then we're, then we're, we're, ending, our, we're ending our executions because we don't actually have a loop yet for our game. But this is the logic that we have for actually like retrieving the move. So I think rather than having this all inside of play, like the play function now is what? It's almost, so it starts on line 17 and it ends on 43. So this is a massive, massive function now. It's way too big, way too big. So what I think we wanna do is just print out like, um, maybe let's make a method take turn and then we'll call it, or yeah, just take turn like that. And then we can uh, remove all of this and put it into uh, take turn. And we could even like break out the loops into their own methods or something. Um, but for now, this should be this should be fine. Uh, okay, select a piece to move. Um, didn't okay, great. All right, I think this is a good start. All right, so we've got our play method here, and we're doing take turn. And then after the turn is successful, so we assume that these loops are just going to keep going until. Uh, valid moves are selected and they kind of like work through picking the right move. After we take a turn, we want to swap the player and then we want to uh, print again and then we want to loop. So I think we could, we could just call play or something to make it sort of uh, recursive or we could just say um, while, um, while the game is not over, uh, do this stuff and then we'll need to figure out what does it mean for the game to be over uh, which for now we can just return false and we can come back and like figure out how we decide whether the game is over because it'll be either one or it'll be check um, or stalemate or something I don't know um, but this should give us a loop so while the game is not over which it's not um, then we're gonna print out the board we're gonna say whose turn it is. We're gonna take the turn and get um, get the input to move the piece. We're actually gonna to try to move it. We're gonna move the piece and then we're gonna print the board uh, or we're gonna swap who the current player is. We're gonna print the board again and keep going. Um, actually, does this, this does print, doesn't it? Render dot render. I think it does. Um, yeah, let's just see. Board renderer. Uh, yes, so we're, we're saying puts, so yeah, it is printing it out. Okay, so we it's Black's turn. We're gonna select a piece to move, one, one, and we're gonna move it to uh, two, one. Okay, and that moved the piece, fantastic. It's White's turn, select a piece to move. And if we pick, uh, what is that, six, six, two, or six, one, and then we do like five, one. All right, we've moved the piece forward, fantastic. All right, it's Black's turn pick a piece. So let's say one, one, two, and let's move it, uh, let's move it two forward. So one, two, 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 
Three, two. All right, fantastic, we moved it forward. Great, it's white's turn. Let's move this white piece forward. So we're gonna pick, what is this, five? Oh gosh, five. This is like good, uh, good brain teaser for trying to figure out where, um, where things are in arrays. <laughs> So five, one, and we want to move it to four, one, and then, okay, so now we can pick this black piece, and that should be at like three, two, and we want to move it so that it takes this white piece here, and that is at four, one. Oh, amazing. So we're taking pieces. We are able to take pieces. So this is cool. This is super cool. So one of the things that we might want to change is like rather than printing this out every single time, I think it makes sense to probably clear the board and I think we might be able to just call clear um, like right before we render I think I don't know um, let's see if clear is a thing it's clear a thing okay maybe we have to like actually shell out to clear so clear is a method like I think this might be a bash or something or it's like a terminal method that clears out the previous output. So let's see if we can actually use this. So one, one, two, two, or two, one. Okay, so it did not, it did not clear it, but whatever, that's fine. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to do like this thing, right? So this is clear, but yeah, it's fine. Uh, one, one, oh, you didn't pick a white move or a white piece. Select piece to move. Oh gosh, uh, six, zero, uh, five, zero. Okay, so we're, we're definitely able to move the pieces around and print the board out, so that's that's pretty sweet. Um, all right, so this clear thing probably isn't gonna work. Um, what do we wanna do now? I think this is probably um, a good stopping point. We were able to sort of like swap which player was the current player. We talked about dependency injection. Um, we are passing a class around and then using the initialize, or newing up or calling the constructor function on that class passing in the board here. So this is kind of a fun little thing that we learned about. Uh, we've got a ternary operator here that's gonna flip who the current player is, that's fun. Um, and yeah, we talked about initializing and working with custom error classes. So this was a, this was a pretty jam-packed, um, a good jam-packed episode. I think, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. And then in the next episode, we can start talking about potentially adding logic to check who's the winner and some other, um, some other gameplay things to uh, to flesh out our chess game. But I think like in practice, right, if you were just using the, the board as it is right now, if you kind of just followed the rules, then technically um, you should be able to um, work with a, a second player and figure out where, um, like where the king is and whether or not you're in check just kind of by looking at the board. So this is almost... We're at the point now where it's as if you had a, a physical board in front of you, right? Um, where you could technically move the pieces in only their valid positions, which so that makes it a little bit um, superior to having a physical board. But uh, we're not actually checking whether you're in check or checkmate or any of those things yet. So, uh, so let's go try to figure that out next. All right, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Okay.